بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأصلي وأسلم على عبده ورسوله محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله This is simply a short rebuttal of the recording that Bilal Davies has recently put out wherein there contains errors in some of the principles of Ahlul Sunnah as well as lies and deception. We must bear in mind that we are at a time when the truthful will be seen as a liar and the liar will be seen as trustworthy. This is because there are diseases within the hearts of the Muslims which they need to cure in order to listen and accept the truth at all times. Hence, without further ado, I shall proceed to speak regarding the following. Number one, Bilal's statements which oppose some of the principles of Ahl Sunnah. Number two, the statements of lies and deception put forward by Bilal Davies. Bilal's statements which oppose some of the principles of Ahl Sunnah. So this is number one. Bilal's statement which oppose some of the principles of Ahl Sunnah. Regarding Aqidah, in the recording, Bilal Davies endorsed the writings of Amjad Rafiq regarding Iman. And it is without doubt that Amjad's writings conflict that which Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'a are upon. Amjad Rafiq posits the following views. Number one, that one can say that actions are conditioned for the perfection of one's Iman. And number two, that one can say that those who leave off all actions with the ability to do so are still Muslims. Both statements are statements of the Murji'a, as both of them posit that actions are not necessary to establish Iman. For further information, one can look at the treatise, the disbelief of the one who leaves off all actions, and the treatise, reminder and clarification, which are both found on my website. Furthermore, to confirm that which I had written regarding Iman, a graduate from the faculty of Dawa expressed his pleasure at my writings and said that Amjad's writings contradict that which was taught in the University of Medina. I therefore wonder what has possessed Bilal to endorse Amjad's writings because the University of Medina does not teach two different beliefs regarding this matter. Numbers, number two, Usul al-Da'wah. This deals with the manner in which one gives da'wah. Bilal Davis justified using such coarse language against me stating that the Sadaf used coarse language when speaking about the people of innovation. Then he further went to prove, quote-unquote, my ignorance by my statement that the manner in which he did it was not the way of the Sadaf. Indeed, the Sadaf Asale used coarse language when speaking about the innovators. I myself used coarse language when speaking about the innovators such as the Khawarij, the Shia, etc. Hence to say that I deny the use of coarse language at times is absolutely ridiculous. However, I shall admit my shortcoming in terms of explaining myself in, the pre in my previous recording. Hence what I was pointing toward was in reality the use of such language in the context and time you were using it or in the time that he was using it as well as the audience in front of which he used such language. The Sadaf Asale used coarse language without doubt, but they used this language when it was appropriate to do so. Hence, the similitude of Bela justifying such use in whichever circumstances he wishes to use it is the, sim is the similitude of a jihadi who sees some verses, hadith, and stories about jihad and wishes to enact them with immediate effect without understanding the context wherein such actions were done. Hence the reality is that Bilal used such language 
in front of an audience, the majority of whom, number one, are not Salafi. Many of them believe, many of them believe that the Imam of the Masjid, meaning Masjid Khalifa, has the status of, the, of a Muslim ruler. One of them told me, after he threatened a Muslim's life, saying that he was waiting on the word of his Imam, you don't have an Imam. Moreover, one finds that during Jummah prayer, there are those who do guard duty outside of the masjid. Likewise, many of them, including long-standing Shura members, do not even know what Salafiya is and are ignorant regarding its principles. Number two, many of those in that audience have inclinations to the Khawarij and ISIS, meaning those who are not from the masjid, they are those who came into the masjid just to hear the lectures. Number three, they know not the names of Sheikh Yahya, Ubaidah Jabri, and Abdullah al-Bukhari. Therefore, to discuss the discord between them does not make any sense. Number four, I have not stepped foot in that masjid for a whole year and counting since I found out that a brother was prevented from praying his Fajr prayer after being physically thrown out by the Imam. And after a brother who was well known in the community was threatened by a young man in the masjid who said, I am just waiting on the word. And up to now, he has not been made to apologize by the Imam. Number five. I don't, go, I don't go all over Trinidad mentioning the issues between Sheikh Yahya and others as it is of no benefit to them. Number six, the, ice, the lecture was about ISIS and not about myself. Therefore, knowing the context wherein Bilal spoke, would it have been more suitable for Bilal to address the questions regarding ISIS and deal with the problems of the said community? Can anyone of some intellect justify using such language in front of a crowd whose problems are far greater than Musa Millington? And I address a question to Abu Khadija also. Yeah, Abu Khadija, I shall ask you a question. Is it that I am a greater problem? Or can't you advise Amran Shagir? who is promoting the recordings of Bilal Davis. Can't you advise him to stay away from a person who is an open enemy to Da'wah to Salafiyah? Can you advise him to stay away from a man who goes on the minbar and goes in uh, lecture halls and speaks against Da'wah to Salafiyah? Can you advise him to that? Or is it, نَتَعَاوَنُ فِي مَا تَفَقْنَا عَلَيْ وَنَعْذِرُ بَعْضُنَا بَعْضًا فِي مَا اخْتَلَفْنَا فِي is it that we cooperate according to what we agree upon and we excuse each other in what we disagree upon? It is clear to any reader that Bilal's statements were not based upon his jealousy for the religion of Allah, but rather they were ad hominem, personal attacks, from which he sought to create mischief. It is unfortunate but that Bilal had to fulfill his desire to attack me and abandon those who he was addressing to the point that many of them who I knew who I know were moving away from the ISIS propaganda are now moving back toward it and wish not to hear about Salafia. In other words, through Bilal's foolhardy actions and haste to make mischief, he ran brothers and sisters further away from the da'wah. So can anyone, including Bilal Davies, justify fulfilling his desires, and at the same time running away brothers and sisters who are upon this propaganda? Can he justify that in any way, form or fashion? La ilaha illallah. Number three, regarding the usul talaqi al-ilm, regarding the, the means and the ways in taking knowledge. Bilal makes a desperate attempt to cast aspersions regarding the books I have completed with different students of knowledge by stating that I didn't study these books under the scholars. Furthermore, he challenged me to name one book that I have completed with a scholar. As for the challenge, I have already answered it. In case he forgot, he may refer to the first tape I put out. 
Secondly, Bilal's aspersions are based upon nothing but desperation. And in this desperation, he has come with an innovative statement which has no precedent whatsoever in the Sunnah. Rather, it opposes it for the following reason. The scholars and students of knowledge are different levels and categories. Therefore, if a student recommended by the scholars transmits the knowledge he attained from the scholars to another person, then that other person has gained knowledge from the medium of that particular student. And this is how knowledge was and is still transmitted and spread up to this day. Hence, to imply that what I have or anyone has learnt or completed under recognized and recommended students of knowledge is invalid. Hence, to imply that what I have or anyone has learnt or completed under recognized and recommended students of knowledge is invalid is indeed a baseless claim that Abu Hakim has no precedence for whatsoever. In fact, I am quite sure that he himself has had the experience of studying the science of hadith or fiqh or usul under those who they consider are not from the scholars in his faculty named the faculty of hadith. In fact, I am sure that he himself has had the experience of studying the science of hadith or fiqh or usul under those they consider are not from the scholars in his faculty named the faculty of hadith. Therefore, is the knowledge he gained in the faculty and the knowledge gained by other students who may have studied under students of knowledge and respect his faculties invalid? I shall leave Abu Hakim to answer that said question. Additionally, even if I studied what he would call bits and bobs, from the scholars, it still counts for knowledge regarding the particular issues which they spoke about. Of course, it would be completely reprehensible if a student speaks beyond his capability. However, if a student learns particular issues from a scholar of the Sunnah and then teaches these specific issues to others, then there is no problem with this. Also, Abu Hakim should look at himself before judging others. He spent 10 years in the University of Medina and didn't graduate. This meant that he was either absent, not assiduous, or didn't understand that which was being taught in the university. Therefore, if he lacked understanding regarding fundamental issues, as is evidenced by his approval of Amjad's writings, or was careless and slack regarding his schoolwork, then it is indeed incredible that he makes brazen statements regarding the understanding of others when he himself has no foundation to make them. Number four, regarding the sciences of Jahwa Ta'deen, or appraisal and disparagement. In this matter, Bilal misused the principle regarding the general disparagement. Although it is accepted from a scholar who is careful with his tongue and fears Allah, there is an exception when the person is speaking regarding an individual who is apparently following the sunnah in statement and action. In order to remove such a person from Salafia, clear evidence must be, presented and, uh, must be presented and established. The failure and unwillingness to present such, coupled with the wish to establish the characteristic of innovation upon a Salafi, is tantamount to following the usul or following the methodology of Fale al Harbi. And without doubt, Bilal still has Fale's deviated principles in his veins and on the tip of his tongue, in that he said regarding my person, Musa Millington, I quote, Musa Millington, whose speech fall into nothing but, nothing but that which has opposed the deen of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger. Wasallam. Yet when asked to present evidence, he claims that. He claims that an undetailed criticism is sufficient and that because he has not given a detailed criticism, it does not mean that he doesn't have evidences. This is Farih Nafsu. This is Farih himself. Indeed, this is sufficient enough to show that he can't bring evidence to show that my statements are nothing but 
that which has opposed the deal. Rather, he may find statements wherein I oppose and expose the bigoted partisanship, the innovated principles, and the heinous lies of Salafi publications time and time again. Additionally, the majority of the oft-repeated statements which are utilized from SPUBs are taken from unknown personalities on the website al Athari, which is run by no other than Fale Al-Harbi. And although Bila Davies recounted them knowing fully well that these accusations came from a website and from those who Sheikh Rabi, Sheikh Suhaimi and other scholars have warned against, I shall not respond to the accusations he has made against the Sheikh as responding to them would be similar to beating a dead horse and telling it to gallop. Hence, those who wish for more information regarding these truncated and cut and paste recordings will find in the website www.aroloomenglish.net that which is sufficient. Number two, and this is section number two, the statements and lies and deception put forth by Bilal Davies. Number one, he said, Wallahi, he advised me. I say to him, to not use the name of your Lord to lie. Number two, he asked me about writing a clarification about Fadeh or regarding Fadeh. I say I shall not oblige him to such a ridiculous request. Number three, he said I was supposed to go to Fadeh when he was praised. I say no one who gets bitten by a snake ever says you should have been bitten by it also. Number four, he asks, if I didn't see you, where were you then? I say, I am not accountable to you. Number five, as for his interpretation of never sat with the scholars, I corrected him since those who listen to such speech may interpret it to mean that I was never in the circle of any scholar. Again, he has to clarify these things to, that, to the audience so that they leave with the correct understanding of the issue at hand. Number six, he said I accepted Salafia in Trinidad. I say that he was grasping for details regarding the circumstances wherein I told him such. However, I shall recount for him the circumstances. Number one, it was by a brother named Abdul Karim's house. Number two, Abu Khadija wasn't within listening distance because he was by the swimming pool and he was wearing a white jersey and a black three-quarter track pants. Number three, Bilal Davies was wearing a white and red gutra, and I was wearing my green Senegalese foam. Number four, it was the first time he came. Number five, I asked him what happened to the brothers in Medina, and he explained this to me in detail. Regarding his claim that I, Musa Millington, accepted Salafia in Trinidad, then his heirs, his heirs, his two heirs, have certainly belied him. I accepted Salafiyyah in Mustafa Thadif after listening to the tapes of Sheikh al Bani and reading a book entitled The Nobility of the People of Hadith. I therefore end this refutation by saying that this would be my last statement regarding the issue, insha'Allah, and knowing the characters and knowing the characters that make up Salafi publications, they will continue to respond even though the truth has been clarified. Therefore, I say to them the following statement of my ancestors in Trinidad. Number one, you can't stop the, the sun from shining. Number two, you can't stop the rain from falling. Number three, you can't stop the cock from crowing. Number four, you can't stop the dog from barking. Number five, you can't stop the donkey from braying. Therefore, as these things are definite, I know for a fact that I would be unable to stop them from lying, deceiving, and distorting the words of their opponents. It is only Allah who can save them from such nefarious activities. May Allah Ta'ala guide us and protect us. May He guide Abu Hakim to safeguard his tongue from committing injustice against the Muslims. And may Allah keep our time busy with righteous deeds and actions. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم